Ladies and gentlemen, the next hour is for Steve Bosca. Wow, thanks. Calm down. What a lovely welcome uh, and a great introduction. Just for that, I'm going to try my very best today. Uh, just for you, sir, because I heard you clap the longest. I appreciate that. <laughs> Second day of the gamification conference, of course, I'm going to kick it off with some gamification. We've got uh, about a dozen water balloons backstage here. I'm going to get um, six people up on stage. You're going to have to bring your cell phones with you if you're selected. Uh, so when I count to three, I want you to check under your seat. I've put a piece of paper underneath every single chair, um, but only some of them have gold stars on them. Okay, wait till I count to three. If you have a gold star, hold it nice and high, okay? One, two, three. Check under your seat. Grab that paper that, that's... That's gum, it's not. <laughs> I'm messing with you, I'm messing with you. There's no, I didn't, no. I, I didn't tape paper under your seats. There, there's, there's no water balloons backstage. I, 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 don't, I don't do that, I don't do that. Okay, let's kick it into gear, for real here. Over the next hour, here's what's gonna happen, and here's what you're gonna get. I'm gonna go over the biggest trends that I've been tracking in the digital engagement world. I'm gonna break them down. Uh, I'm gonna make it clear to you what the problems and solutions are as, as we see them today. Then I'm going to help you learn how to spot major engagement flaws in designs. And then finally, the highlight uh, is the world premiere we're going to unveil today for the first time ever in public, a tool that you can use to empower you to make better decisions, um, better than anyone else in your industry around designing engagement experiences. So here's the thing, I think we all know or else we wouldn't be here. Community retention, engagement, loyalty, motivation. This used to be an afterthought in business, but today it is the single biggest competitive driver that's keeping some of the top brands at the top of their industries. So companies like Sephora, Nike, Amazon, uh, Netflix, KPMG, Hyatt, all of these companies know something that I think we all know, that building an audience is not the big thing. It's retaining and engaging them. The problem is, unless you work at one of those companies, you don't know what full engagement looks like or, or what to even look for because you've never seen it. So, really curious, who in this room is responsible for managing or maintaining a community of either customers or employees. It's just a show of hands. Okay, so a, a decent number of you. So every one of you right now, if you give a thought for a moment about that top five or 10% of your community, think about who those people are. I'm sure you know them, I'm sure you know how they behave and everything, but think about this. At this very minute, probably 50 to 70% of them aren't as fully engaged as they could be because they haven't been given enough to do. Now let's move on to the other 90%, the ones that are in the lower tiers. Obviously there's more that you need and want them to do, but they're just not doing it because they haven't, um, they haven't been given the opportunity to. So you know who is giving them stuff to do, both the top and lower tiers, or who are trying to, those companies that I mentioned before. So that's how high the stakes is, and that's why this industry, this field right now, is as hot uh, as it's been. So what I'll be talking today is the most current stuff in the world. That's not hyperbole. Um, I, I'm going to share what I've learned about the forefront of this market. I'm going to help you present better experiences for your community. I'm gonna kick it off with the top uh, three trends that we're seeing today. So we can all agree that just building a community of customers is difficult, but retaining and motivating them is even harder. And if they're not fully engaged with your company, your brand, your message, then you're looking at probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of lost revenue or productivity or sales every month. The reason is people have options, more so than they've ever had before, about where to work, where to buy, what they want to do with their spare time. And we know from current research today that the old ways of doing things, um, top grading, contests, loyalty programs, compliance incentives, these things don't work anymore. Next is this uh, unsurprising trend that we've seen that online communities, uh, pardon me, it's an always online world. People are constantly 
online, how much time do you think the average adult spends per day on connected devices, like actually looking at or interacting with a connected device in a 24-hour day, the average adult? Three hours. Four. Five point nine hours a day on connected devices. Why is this? Well, one of the key reasons is because it provides a channel for validation. It provides connection, recognition. It provides that little feedback that you get uh, that, that people are really starting to find extremely important. And they love the fact that it's instantaneous or almost instantaneous. So as humans, those little touches, those little pokes, those little expressions of affection from other humans, even if it's just uh, attention, is very satisfying and it's very fulfilling to, to desires that we have. And we find now that if you do that enough, then it does drive loyalty, it drives motivation, sometimes in the face of what would otherwise be contrary evidence that you should not be doing that. Um, for a great example of this, I uh, think you should look no further than the master of the morning toilet tweet, Donald Trump who pushes out all of this attention, even if it's negative attention, and yet he does it with such velocity that uh, it keeps people engaged with the message. So if you're looking at supporting a community of customers or um, employees or a sales force, you have to have highly personalized and nearly instantaneous feedback for them. And that's how you will address a dominant need or a trend. And you'll probably, um, if you can't do that, you'll probably never be president of the United States. Not that you'd want to be. And then the third major trend is that SaaS technology infrastructure has dramatically brought down the cost of delivering and supporting these kinds of programs. So things like cloud hosting, rapid deployment, um, development tools, they've made it possible for us to revolutionize the industry and things that used to cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars before, can be done at probably five to 10 times less cost than they used to be able to. So, where that leaves us now, um, if I'm to look into my crystal ball five years into the future, the first thing I see is Netherlands qualifying for the 2022 World Cup. Yeah. Could happen. Next thing I see is companies recognizing the convergence of these three forces and gaining top spot in their categories by doing something very simple, applying affordable, cost-effective technologies to engage their communities, collect insight, and provide a more personalized and relevant experience. That's a simple summary of it. How will they do it? Well, everybody loves the idea of a silver bullet, one-size-fits-all solution. And in gamification, I think in the early years, we've seen it all. Uh, badges, points, leaderboard schemes that you would just plug in, snap in. These do sometimes work short-term, um, but long-term they tend not to be effective. And at worst, they can actually backfire completely and create active disengagement. So it may seem appealing. Uh, sometimes you can even plug these systems in and you can actually see benefits and results. And even if that was long-term, the fact that you can just plug it in means that if it's working and it's proven to be working, your competitors are gonna have them plugged in that very same afternoon. And then there goes your competitive advantage and all of that investment. So the truth is, the problem's complicated, uh, it's always evolving, it's hard to keep up with, and what used to keep people loyal and motivated and engaged really doesn't work anymore. So you try those old solutions today and you actually can get active disengagement. Now, around all of these trends, there's some big problems. Um, but they can be overcome and they're, they're broken down basically into two parts. So problem one is knowing even what you should do and what you can do and what even matters when you're trying to motivate and engage a community. So if you're not approaching the problem with the right lens, then you're probably um, better off not doing it at all. So as you know, I'm Steve Bosca. I am, if you can believe it, I believe still today, the only CEO of a gamification company with any experience designing successful AAA uh, video games in the video game industry. What that looks like, uh, going back to 1999, uh, the year before the Y2K bug took us all down, I uh, worked for this Mickey Mouse company. Um, having these properties to work with and to create a catalog of edutainment, which are two, <laughs> two words that should never ever be squashed together. 
Uh, those are two things that are difficult to do enough on their own, let alone to try to do them um, simultaneously. Uh, after that, I moved on to a number of other projects. This is a sample of them, but I was a producer on Simpsons Hit and Run for Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo. Sold 4.7 million units of that, over $200 million in revenue. Uh, Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2, that was um, 3.8 million units sold, about 150 million in revenue. Um, I was the producer and lead gameplay designer on CSI 1, 2, and 3. There were about 15 cases in there. I designed all the cases, wrote about half of those stories. Uh, about 4, 4.9, about 5 million units sold of that, about 125 million in revenue. And um, founded Hothead Games, great mobile game success story, lots of great IP. Uh, about 130 employees right now in Vancouver. I'm also involved in a virtual reality gaming company. Pug Farm, my current company, actually started as a video game company. We transitioned into gamification. So, why does this experience matter? I'll tell you simply. Um, think about this. Think about how most people approach engagement and loyalty and motivation today. They lay out simple challenges, they make it clear for people what they want them to do, and then if the community behaves, then they get something for it. So you're basically bribing the community into doing what you want them to do. Well, um, here's my world. Millions of people have paid their own money to play the games that I've made. I never had to pay them a cent, I never had to bribe them. They participated because it was enjoyable and intrinsically motivating. Uh, I, I think, undisputedly, video games are the gold standard of engagement right now. Here's how high that bar is. If you were to launch, this is research that, by the way, just came out about two, two and a half weeks ago. If you launch an online game today, if less than 30% of the players that play it today don't come back tomorrow, that's a huge red flag. You either need to find a way to fix that problem immediately, or you should just kill the project. I'll let that sink in. 30% have to come back the next day, otherwise the trend is failure. When you look at the kind of games that I worked on here, the success rate in these big budget blockbuster games is about 20%. So 80% of these games fail. If you look in the mobile space, like Hothead, those games are competing against probably three or 400 games that come out in the App Store every single day. So if you're in that business, you're basically buying one expensive lottery ticket after another. That's the business that you're in. But I've got some amazing news for all of us here today. Because the good thing that gamification projects have is something that isn't just entertainment for the sake of entertainment. It's an existing relationship that's already motivating. So it's either an employee who is hired by a company and there's a start of engagement there, there's a nucleus of it, or you're a customer that has a relationship with a brand or a product line or, or services, and you've got a relationship there. There's expectation, there's, there's satisfaction, there's all kinds of things that you can work on. So all we're doing really is putting a layer of engagement on top of that nucleus and gamification. Now, I said all we're doing, I don't want to trivialize it because it's still extremely difficult. And to be clear, I'm not talking about building video games for companies and brands. What I'm talking about is presenting the mechanics and the interfaces that make it possible to exploit the motivational psychology that makes games like this successful. So those things are uh, things like collaboration, competition, vanity, prestige, collection, completion. It's those things and thinking about the problem that way that um, can create this like deep engagement. It's natural for me, but it's next level thinking for many people. So. Knowing what works and what doesn't work and having a toolkit to design these mechanics without force-fitting is, uh, is really essential. So under problem two, the solutions are complicated. So even when um, you know what you're wanting to build, to build it can be expensive, difficult to maintain, hard to design. So when people look down the scary barrel of that gun, sometimes they walk away or they start looking for those silver bullet solutions. So that leaves you with a buy, rent, or build decision. Um, that's probably a topic that deserves its own session, and there you go, now you've got a reason to come back next year. Do, yeah, right. Do, does everybody know what a PB&J is? 
Peanut butter and jelly, okay. Did you know that this was a thing? A PB&L? For real, this is the thing. It's peanut butter lettuce. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I actually think that's mayonnaise there on top of it. That is hideous. Uh, of course, PB and L to us means something different. It's points, badges, and leaderboards. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this because I think I'm preaching to the choir. But my observations on the first six or seven years of gamification, uh, P, points, what are you doing? You're actually just bribing people. There's typically some kind of an economic promise that's made there. You give me your time, you give me your purchases, your, your money, uh, you give me your attention, and I'll give you this sometimes virtual currency back, sometimes it's prizes back. It really, you know what it does, I think, cheapens the relationship. It says that all I care about is this economic transaction. Bribery is not engagement. Uh, badges, okay, so grade three, uh, you, in school you did what you're supposed to do, you got perfect on your spelling test, you got your little star, makes you feel momentarily a sense of pleasure, pride, satisfaction, whatever. But even back in grade two, eventually the concept wore thin pretty fast. The reason is the badge, that little sticker, is really not much more than a token. It's a little souvenir. It's a reflection of, more accurately, the hard work that your teacher put into creating the lesson plan and that's what was engaging. This is really just a, a, a sticker on a piece of paper that's a motivational dead end, and an interactive dead end. Um, perhaps even worse is taking the points and badges and accumulating them or tallying them up and somehow ranking people against each other, because uh, it poses a very potentially serious and harmful problem, best summarized here. So if you get my point, um, I can think of few things that are as potentially damaging or devastating as a leaderboard in the wrong place. Now, to be fair, uh, a leaderboard in a highly competitive environment makes perfect sense. Talk about employee engagement. Uh, the one department in every company that is highly individualistically competitive is a sales force. The sales department are cutthroat pack hunters. They don't mind stepping over each other. Yeah, you put something like this here, nice, perfect alignment. Um, sports fans, actually, even sports fans of the same team. You can put leaderboard-like structures because you're drawn to sports for the love of competition. You take the other departments in a company, marketing, uh, accounting, human resources, operations. The best way for those departments to operate is collaboratively. If you introduce a mechanic like this to a collaborative environment, it's potentially destructive. You're asking them to focus on the wrong things. So uh, these thing, PBL, um, sandwich aside, these are useful tools in particular applications, but uh, all they really do is measure and record and reflect back uh, a participant's progress. Never once during my career of designing video games did I ever look at a poorly designed level or a mechanic and say, if we just give the player 2,000 points here and a badge, it'll make everything better. <laughs> if I were to bring that up at a design meeting, uh, my teammates would beat me senseless with a sack of joysticks. Because <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't create any kind of engagement at all. So, what do we do with all this? Because all I've done so far is, uh, I've talked about the converging forces. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity, we know that. I've talked about what the problems are, and I've talked about what you shouldn't do, but not with any solutions. I hate people like me. <laughs> but I'm going to make it up to myself, because ladies and gentlemen, you are about to witness the world premiere unveiling of the newest, hottest, most revolutionary modern advancement in the history of engagement technology. Uh, this isn't quite it. Who knows what that is? Yes. S Su Super the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, correct. Otherwise abbreviated as the SNES. Now we're getting somewhere. But did you know there's a new SNES in town? You probably didn't. 
because this is the <laughs> unveiling of it right now. Steve's net engagement score. What Steve's net engagement score does is it measures the health of your community through a very simple, easy to understand equation that we're currently working on the white paper for, which I will give you instructions at the end of the session of how to get on the wait list to receive a copy of that when it's done. But we do have the equation created. I'm gonna share that with you and show you how we derived it. So step number one is the denominator, which we have listed here as raw interactive inputs, AKA clicks, which used to be the measure of engagement that we had available to us, say, 10, 15 years ago. Clicks on site, sometimes time on site. That was the best we really had, but think of how silly, silly, silly that is. It's ridiculous to believe that a click is engaging. But that's all we had, so it's all we measured. I, I, I think so little of that that I threw it into the denominator. And it's going to live there for the rest of eternity. On the numerator, the first thing we have are interesting choices. Now, interesting choices are very important because to just choose between two things blindly is not engaging, but to have an interesting choice presented to you, suddenly that elevates my, uh, my, my heart rate a little bit. The second thing that is a factor up top is consequences. So interesting choices, in particular those that have consequence. Now we're starting to get somewhere because Previously, we just had raw interactive inputs, just click, 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 and now we actually have um, this notion that what I'm doing may have an impact later or longer term. Now this is more engaging. And what's interesting about this is that back in uh, 2003, I published a paper and presented it at the Game Developers Conference, and it was called Temptation and Consequence Dilemmas in Video Games. And it was, all, it was a very deep examination, you can still get the paper online on Gamma Sutra, a very deep examination on how dilemmas and uh, temptation and consequence can really drive participation and attention and really get people um, focused and, and entertained. It's a very entertaining proposition. Who can guess what the third numerator factor is? If you, if you get this, maybe we'll co-author a paper someday. Who said what? Fun? Fun? Time pressure. Urgency. When you add the notion that something is limited, there's some scarcity, in particular time, now the blood pressure really gets up. So this is, this is the whole equation. Now I'm gonna start showing you how it all makes sense. What you're trying to do, if you want the greatest engagement possible, maximize the numerator, minimize the denominator, and you get a nice big number. How does that look on a spectrum? Well, um, it goes from zero to infinity, because it's a ratio. And where things fit in, this is baseline for us. This is the one over one. Okay, one interesting choice with one interaction. You type in a search phrase into Google. Um, I know, what's a good one? Donald Trump's hairstyle. <laughs> and you click uh, the image search and you get a bunch of pictures. So I've made one interesting choice, I put a search term in, and I've made one click, one over one. Now I'm presented with a bunch of results. I click on one of those results and it gives me a response. Now, you can actually make Google far more engaging if you wanted to, and sometimes you have to. Sometimes there's a, a real moment of uh, either greater consequence or higher time pressure. Imagine, uh, imagine the theater was suddenly on fire and I had to hop on the computer to do a Google search to find the fire department. Suddenly, it's the same Interesting choice, I have to find a fire department quickly, it's the same single click, but the consequence is higher, and the time pressure is now higher, because I have to get that fire department. Fire department, why is it called fire department? You need water, you should go to the water department. I already have fire. <laughs> Just thought of that. What's that? 
Oh, firefighters. Yeah, that's a, a better. Okay, firefighters. We call it the firefighter department. So suddenly the numerator has gotten much bigger. The denominator is still one or a small number. Even within the Google search world, it's not always one over one. Sometimes by, by different factors, that's going to um, slide you up and down the scale. Way up at this end, um, 50, we're still trying to validate what the, what the low end is on video games, but um, I don't know, who's, who's, who played a game recently? What's, who's a gamer? What, what did you play just now, recently? Skyrim. Skyrim? Okay. Uh, to get into Skyrim, you log in, you click on play, there's a couple of little raw interactive inputs. Once you're in Skyrim, how many interesting choices that have consequence do you make within an hour? Lots. Like, it could be thousands, it could be tens of thousands in games like Call of Duty. So the, the numerator gets very, very large in especially high action, high adrenaline video games. And that's why we put infinity up at the, I, I don't even know how to measure some of the consequential, interesting, time pressured activities that we have. But there's things at the lower end of that too. Um, before I get to gamification, I want to talk about something that is, if you can believe it, left of Google. So what that's going to look like is um, an, maybe an interesting choice, but one that takes me a lot of clicks to get what I'm looking for from. So um, let's say I'm reading an article on, uh, what's it called? Um, the Telegraph, and I get down to the bottom, and there's all these little boxes at the bottom, and one of them says, um, what is the cast of Gilligan's Island doing today? Well, of course I want to know that. So I click on it, and instead of, as Google very dutifully does, giving me the answer, it gives me a slideshow. And this slideshow has 37 slides in it. And I have to start clicking my way through those sites, the clickbait, classic clickbait. You know, 37 things you didn't know about Brad Pitt. And I'm clicking my way through it. What that's doing is it's increasing the denominator. The number is getting smaller. I made one interesting choice. You've just stretched that information out to me over the series of 37 clicks. By the time I get to 12, I've had it. I'm done. I close the browser down and I move on. They don't care, because they got what they were looking for out of me. They weren't looking for engagement. They were looking for 12 clicks. And they know that I've hit my threshold. So a clickbait website is disengagement, but it's disengagement for a business purpose, and they're happy to do it. But that has its own category, and that's not what any of us are here to try to do. So you see how the equation even holds up into the realm of active disengagement which a clickbait site is. What we're left with then is gamification. Now we're still trying to figure out if there really are, there's, there's possibly gaps between here, but the truth of it is that within gamification is a spectrum and the caution or the danger is that you allow it to sink too far down it, where it's, it's not interesting enough to be truly gamification or that you've pushed it too far into the realm of video games, which isn't a good thing. Video games are its own category with its own purpose. What's being sold there is entertainment. And that's never what gamification is selling. Gamification doesn't sell entertainment. It sells some business outcome that may be entertaining to fulfill. But as soon as it goes into pure entertainment, you're in a different business and you're in a very cutthroat business, and trust me, you don't want to be there. You will not win against companies who only do entertainment for the sake of entertainment, because the failure rate is high enough there, and they have a lot of resources to throw at that opportunity. So let's be realistic and honest here about where we're fighting our battles. The battle is engagement that's on top of a business purpose. And where does that engagement live? It's somewhere in this realm. Um, I, I, are, any questions about this? I, I will take questions at the end, but I kind of want to get the model out of the way. Yes? Hmm. You have to measure the interesting coins. Yeah. 
Raw interactive inputs are things like clicks or entering, a, uh, entering text into a field. It's something where the choice, uh, the interaction is automatic and where there is little option to do otherwise. So it's the activity uh, I will do to reach the interesting choices, consequence, and time pressure. It's, it's sometimes a necessary moment of input, but in the case of clickbait, it, isn't, it, it, it can be unnecessary. It could have its own insidious purpose. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, yes. Oh, sorry, gentleman in the light blue. By the way, I'm going to take this forward and show you how this can be modeled and show you some case studies as well. I'm interested, what are the, uh, what are the units of consequences and time pressure? I can't tell you that just yet. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you, but I don't want to tell you because that, that, that'll be reflected in the white paper. And it's, I, even the white paper won't say exactly how we measure it because it's a bit of our secret sauce right now. Our, our platform actually supports the features that go into the measurement of consequence and um, and time pressure, and interesting choices for that matter. Okay, we're good for now? Okay, because there'll, there'll be more time at the end. Just want to make sure that we're not rolling ahead. So this is a boring old way that we used to do things. Desired actions, desired actions. They're in a cloud, and you give people some kind of either a digital, real world, some kind of a, some kind of a reward or reaction for it. I'm going to show you how you take the notion of interesting choices, consequences, and time pressure, not time pressure. We don't use time pressure a lot in gamification. You can, you can do like time-limited challenges and things like that, but it tends to be more, the easier way to do it is interesting choices with consequence. I'm gonna show you how um, you can model it in a, there's, we've probably come up with a dozen different ways to model it. I'm gonna show you one of the models that's been very effective. Uh, and that is, we call it a double-stacked engagement funnel, um, it's just internally. But we start off by presenting interesting choices to the user. I'll show you an example of it in a minute. We then make those consequential, and then once they've achieved enough of them, then we convert that into a currency. Now, that closes the funnel down. It's kind of abstracted all of their actions in a very entertaining way, and it's given them a currency. Now, some people would stop there. What we actually do in many of our projects is we make that the starting point of the next funnel but we expand it out then. So we've converged it down to a currency. We now give you that currency in a redemption model to make more interesting choices with how you spend that currency that now have consequence because there are gameplay rules around what you've just bought. So, sorry, you were talking about Skyrim. I'm sure many people have played. I, you're probably getting the parallel because in Skyrim, what happens as you're playing? What are you accumulating? Levels. Is there anything else? Skills, and then what, so the, all of the stuff that you do in the game, all these interesting choices and consequences of time pressure is giving you levels and skills. So it funnels down to my level and my skill. What can I then do with my level and skill? Well, actually, there, there's more to it than that. What, what, cash, yeah, there's currency in Skyrim. What can you spend the currency on? So I, I'm, with that currency, I make interesting choices and depending on what I buy, it's consequential, and doesn't that then loop me back up to the main game? So this funnel is a very classic video, this double funnel is a very classic video game model. We actually can do this in gamification, and we should do it in gamification. This is, uh, <laughs> okay, see what that says right there? This is, this is what our funnel looks like when it's modeled out. This is one, one model of it. I'm gonna zoom in to the three there's three phases within it. Uh, so this is the top part of the funnel, interesting choices. So we have quests, we have content challenges, we have potentially mini games. This is from one of our projects. So these are high frequency interactions that are interesting to the user, that are consequential to them. And if they perform enough of these, uh, they, kind of snap together, they give you these treasure chests or whatever they are, and currency comes out of it. Now, some people stop there and they say, okay, well that's your points or that's your levels and that's all we need to do. We take it another step further. The currency then allows the user to spend it on either personalizing their avatar, possibly these collection challenges that are themed or content oriented. There's an element of, um, 
This is like a pick three, like a little digital scratch ticket thing that gives you digital collectibles that have rich media and rich content in them. So it, there's a game down here too of completing these categories and how the categories interact and there's even multiplayer possibilities and how all this can work. So the currency is just the starting point of it kind of fanning out into more consequential decisions. And in this case, there's actual time pressure as well in some of our projects. And of course, what th this is where we kick the user out and give them the levels. It's not until they get down to here. It's not based on the coins, it's based on what happens down at this level. So when you level out here, that's when it could potentially unlock more of this stuff back up at the top. And that's a nice, it's just a wonderful, lovely, large engagement loop that you would see in classic games, but without the probably $80 million budget that it took to get there. It's just the mechanic of it, and it's just the structure of it. You can carry that over and apply it from video games into gamification, not lose anything, but it does, uh, it does take design. Uh, oh, okay, so this is where I was kind of bringing it together. So um, all of those interesting choices and consequence and currency, then you spend the currency on stuff that have consequence and interest, and then it loops all the way back up to the top. Uh, Okay, so now what I want to do is, um, in the time remaining, I'm going to give a few examples of projects, and then I'm going to open it up for, for discussions. But I'm going to take you through, here's something that we did for um, Cotex in uh, Latin America. So they had been experimenting for a while with social media contests, things that was, were trying to boost engagement just through simple interactions. But for the most part, what they were experimenting with was gimmicks and promotions and things that weren't really increasing sales. Our starting point was that they had a good product line, they had lots of information, they had enough response from things like sweepstakes and other um, more straightforward mechanics to know that the audience was gonna respond to this. So I'll just cherry pick a few elements out of here. One of the things that we included um, from our platform was the notion of personalized and dynamic user profiles. So as you're participating in the various challenges that are brand related, you are able to build up your profile. So that means that your actions have long-term consequence because your profile is growing and it's becoming personalized to you. There was um, certainly competitive ranking and recognition, which is there was a leaderboard system for one particular part of it. Um, we did a lot of leveraging of their content, which made their content consequential. So we took their product line um, information and we made a game out of collecting and combining some of the products. Uh, and you can see what we did with the, the net engage, the Steve's net engagement score. It started out at about one. It was like barely better than a, a Google site because they had a lot of clicks that were not even really necessary. And by the time we wrapped it up, it was um, sort of in a range that was below 10, but still quite a bit higher than what they um, had started with. This is the Canada Space Agency. Uh, we're going live with this within a few weeks. So there's a mission to the, Canada, to the International Space Station. There's a Canadian astronaut on board, David St. Jacques. He's launching, I think, December 3rd. And we're presenting this um, system to uh, the children of the world so that they can follow along the mission and be more deeply engaged. Well, their starter website was as, as government as you could possibly imagine. There wasn't a shred of sexiness to it at all. And um, a lot of static content, the presentation was very dated. Uh, in, in some flows, the net engagement was actually less than one. Poorly targeted. So we added a lot of new stuff to it. Um, some of the more interesting things were responsive unlocking of new challenges. So this idea of branching quests, uh, not just within one flow where you start in one place and everybody gets two options in and then everybody gets four options as you get deeper into the system, but quests based on the profile of the user. So different user types would get different kinds of quests that unlocked in different ways. Much in the same way you start uh, a complex RPG, it finds out whether you're a fighter or a magician or an alchemist or whatever, and based on that it gives you like different leveling trees and different progression models. Um, 
We also added a bunch of mini games to this. So going back, gosh, must be what, 25 years ago to the golden age of advert gaming, where you would just take Tetris and put like Oreo cookies on it, or you would take Mahjong and you know, layer little cheese slices. What we learned from that is that you can't just do that. You can't just reskin a game and in isolation make it interesting and fun and have people really identify and associate with the brand. You can, though, create a gamified model that has quests and that has different leveling and structures and that has this big internal consistency to it, and then have mini-games included as part of that flow and make the mini-game results consequential to the larger system. So for this, we actually have um, a mini-game tab with six mini-games that'll be launching all space-themed, all have to, with the Canada arm and things that ro you launch rockets. That's not the game. It's just one of the engagement channels that are available to you at the top of the entry that's giving you interesting choices. What game am I going to play next? And the consequence of that is that I'm earning the currency that I need to play this content challenge that happens later. So there are some very fun first elements of the game, but they don't exist in isolation. Uh, I'm going to skip by this one, and I'll probably I'll just close out with this one here, because this is it's one of my it's one of the oldest ones, but it's one of my favorite ones. It's, this was a TV show called Ice Pilots, and Ice Pilots is uh, it's no longer around, but we did this. I think it was a fifth or sixth season uh, engagement system for them, um, quite a few years back now, and their problem was, as with most uh, TV sh series and shows. The fans never get the kind of engagement that they want, and they never get the sense of connection to a community that they'd really love to have when they love something as much as they do here. So uh, what we did here, this was, um, we actually did have some mini games here, but what was really cool about this was at the bottom part, at the second uh, stage of the, the, the second funnel, the collection game that we created there was so lovely. It's just still my favorite to this day we gave people digital collectibles that they earned through a variety of different means. So you could play this um, air hunt game, you'd fly around and you'd find these little trading cards. You'd also find them by hunting around the website and clicking on these little things. There are ways that you could find code words on the social media channels. You'd plug those in, those would give you chances to get these digital cards. That's one part of it. What we did with the cards was especially cool. Every week there was a different challenge. So week one, the challenge was, who are your favorite cast members? So you'd play all of these things to get all of your cards up there, and then you would organize them into your own set of these are my eight favorite cast members, and then you'd click lock. And as soon as you click lock, it would scan the community to find other people who also selected those same eight cast members, and you would get points for making connections with those people. That was actually the game. It was to connect with like-minded people, to find people that you didn't know, but that you should know because they had a lot in common with you. That was the game, and people loved it. So, uh, oh, this is a toilet rebate program. <laughs> I'm gonna skip that one. Because um, everyone knows how you would engage something, uh, engage around something like that. Right, so, so those are, there, there are many, many examples um, of how this can actually work. I think it's clear from these examples uh, what we're talking about, how it all works, um, quite frankly, why we're so busy these days. Where have we ended up this morning? Well, we know the stakes. Community retention is the highest um, importance factor right now, single biggest competitive driver that makes companies successful. We've established the converging forces. So there is a window of opportunity that we can step through now if we're careful. Um, and that includes the dynamics of an always online community and uh, understanding and appreciating what they're looking for and all of these low-risk technologies that are making possible for us to get solutions into market quickly. Uh, we know the key problems, that the complexity of um, figuring out what works best and the challenges behind that, the dilemma of buy versus build versus rent, um, and uh, now you've had a crash course in Steve's net engagement score, where you can leverage the principles of dilemmas and consequences and, and urgency to drive engagement. So um, I hope you are able to apply this to your future or current projects. Um, and I hope you use these principles to help us all advance the science of keeping people interested. 
uh, or at very least use them somehow to take down Donald Trump. That would be good. <laughs> um, here are the instructions for getting on the white, uh, white paper wait list. Um, by all means, uh, shoot, shoot an email off to that. And let's use just the remaining few minutes here, however much we have, um, for any questions I'm glad to take. Yes, sir. Uh, hi. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Really interesting. Uh, I do have one question, though, uh, because you spent half of the presentation just bashing on PBL. And uh, then you show us a funnel that's basically PBL. So and perhaps I'm wrong, perhaps I'm wrong, but uh, what you, the, the, the examples that you bashed on are basically PBL done wrong. And we've all seen that being applied into social networks, so everything can be done wrong and then it's easy to bash on it. But I don't know, how many of you have done different types of leaderboards? So not just a traditional one-on-one -on -one comparison. Ra raise your hands if, yeah, there's a lot of different types of leaderboards, a, a lot of different types of points, a lot of different types of badges, and we've all been doing that in some way or another, ones better than, than others, of course. But I'm, I'm really interested to know how does that differ from what we've been doing, because it, uh, at least for me, and maybe I didn't pay enough attention, but at least for me, the difference wasn't clear, because we do earn points, and then we, a lot of us do virtual currency and we can trade it in a catalog or, or for uh, new opportunities or for boosters or for whatever. Those are interesting choices. They have consequences. Yes, they change the gameplay. We've all been doing that, uh, but at the starting point, you said that most of us haven't been doing that. So that's the, the first thing I wanted to, to, to address. And the second one, I'm curious to know if you've applied that to employee engagement because uh, if there's one thing that that employee engagement area defers a bit, is that there's not much that you can do to change the normal activity of the employee. So if he's a sales guy, he's still going to do the sales process as it is. What you can do is you sprinkle gamification mechanics on top and try to make the activity itself more engaging. So you can there's some things that you can mess around with, but you can't just put mini games in their path because you can't tell their employees they're going to stop to play a mini game. That cannot happen. You have to provide them with uh, feedback mechanisms. And so there are some limitations in the employee engagement area that I'm curious to know if you've tried and used that, uh, that framework to solve and what, what, what results have you had, and I'm really interested to know. Thank you. Uh, so I guess there's two things there. The first one, um, I, maybe we agree. That's fine. I mean, if, if you're doing things similar to this, fantastic. Most of what I see isn't like this. Uh, and most of what I see is simple application without a larger engagement model that has structure to it, that has different tiers and levels to it, that has feedback mechanisms that are driving repeat participation and repeat engagement. We see a lot of mechanics thrown out there where the mechanic is intended to solve the problem. So gr great if you are, and I don't think I said everybody is doing it wrong. Uh, and if you're one of the ones that aren't, fantastic. Uh, as far as employee engagement goes, uh, I, mean, I don't know where to start answering that question. It's such a huge and complicated area. It's not something that we could ever give guidelines around. Our discovery phase for employee engagement problems is way longer than it is for customer engagement. Uh, we need to really understand what the personality and the dynamics are of the departmental requirements and of, the, of how people are interacting with each other before we could even begin to select from the, there's probably a dozen different mechanics that we could apply. Do you have any case study where you've applied that framework to employee engagement? Not, not prepared in this presentation, no. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm really interested in the, uh, the NAS uh, engagement score uh, application. I um, was kind of wondering <clears throat> how it uh, works um, uh, when you look at uh, retainability or lastability uh, of a game. Uh, Google scores a one and uh, every other game scores a lot higher uh, when you look at engagement. But I still visit Google every day and almost every game is in my, uh, yeah, on a shelf uh, catching uh, dust. So 
was wondering, uh, since you want people to come back, wants clients to come back, um, yeah, I understand that is that the case, you know, that uh, if you have a particular website, it says something about the particular website if you uh, uh, grade up the score, uh, but how do they uh, interact with each other? Hmm. So the big difference between Google and uh, an engagement system like a video game is that the purpose of a game is to entertain, and entertainment is driven by novelty. So as long as something feels novel and fresh, uh, people will keep playing the game. That's why the easiest way to keep an MMO going is to just add a few new levels. But even then, that'll eventually run its course because you can only get so much out of it. Google is a utility, and utility has much longer term value. So the reason that Google is interesting to you is not because of Google itself, but because of what it gives you as a function of it being a utility. So you just have to, it's not fair to make those comparisons and to judge yourself against it, especially when it comes to replayability, because there's never been a game created that I can think of where people don't eventually get tired of it. And, and this is something that we do have to explain to people. I think all of us as you know, practitioners or consultants in this space need to be honest about that with our clients or our projects, that this isn't like plugging in a shopping cart where we know that 20 years from now people will be perfectly satisfied making their purchases. This is something that is more like a campaign that people can grow tired of, but we'll do our best to make that lifetime value as high as possible. Just have to keep those notions separate. Yes. On the thought of lifetime, what would you say, um, on average, is the lifetime of one of your solutions? So you're saying about you know, games have a year, two year, three year. How long can you run one of these solutions before you have to start injecting more content and updating things? Uh, on a per user basis or for a client? Uh, many years. Yeah, I mean, I, so let me back up on that. Uh, when you implement the model, there needs to be a provision in that model where the refreshing of content is going to keep the lifespan of that going. That's part of the ROI calculation they have to make. There's this initial investment, which is going to be substantial, and then there's these content expansions that are going to be a fraction of the cost of the original. And you, in aggregate, you have to you know, amortize all of that out and figure out whether or not the Engagement return and the business benefit of that offsets all of that cost. But it does get cheaper as, as you go along, but people also become more and more familiar with it. And then the other complexifying factor is that we don't know how the customer is going to be driving new audience members into that system. So you could potentially launch something, have it run its course over two or three years, but the way you revive it is by the brand acquiring a new audience and putting them into this old system, which doesn't feel old to them. Like if you've never played a Sega Genesis, and I gave you one right now, even though it's a 20-year-old system, you'd probably have fun with it for months or maybe even years. So because new audience members change that dynamic, it, it's hard to, it, it's, there's many factors. Yeah. So. So I hope you're satisfied with this answer, and if not, you can always talk to Steve. No. As no, you no, can you do, yes, he will be all, here all day, and he will answer all of your questions. <laughs> As you can, yeah, you can. <laughs> Otherwise, talk to each other during the next break. See you again in half an hour. Have a great coffee. Steve Buska. Thank you.